In the flush of youth, some of us are prone to great bouts of certainty, seriousness, and risk-taking. Others are more cautious. And some just want to have fun, sometimes at all costs. Today's guest is an author whose recent novel explores the timelessness of coming-of-age stories with a very modern tale of her own. She's Tara Isabella Burton, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. This week we're joined by Tara Isabella Burton, an acclaimed author of fiction and nonfiction. Her most recent book is The World Cannot Give, which was published in 2022. Uh, she joins us today from her home. Tara, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. So I said, I mentioned to you before we started recording that I think I liked this book a little bit more than I was supposed to, uh, but we're going to talk about that in a second. But I want to begin with you and your journey as a writer, uh, because you've got, if I'm not mistaken, a doctorate in theology from Oxford University. What did a nice theologian like you do becoming a novelist? I think my doctoral supervisor might have asked me the same. <laughs> um, so I always was fascinated in, in so many kind of different ways and different directions by the idea that um, kind of uh, this hunger for faith, this hunger for understanding how the world fits together uh, isn't just uh, an intellectual exercise. Um, I think the stereotype of theology is that you're figuring out, you know, how many eight angels dance on the head of a pin. Um, but for me, and this came out of my academic work, um, theology is a way of understanding people. What do we believe about the world? What do we believe about who made it or didn't make it? What that means about our relationship to one another, uh, our relationship to ourselves, what we want. And so uh, for me, at least, uh, writing novels, uh, novels about people who were trying to figure out those questions, often in ways that were uh, exciting plot-wise, uh, for me felt like a natural outgrowth of my uh, theological research. Um, so when I was done with my doctorate, I had um, sold my first novel, Social Creature, I moved back to New York to work for uh, Vox.com as their religion correspondent and um, kind of tried to explore side by side uh, the hunger for, for, for meaning and experience in these two very different ways, fiction and nonfiction, that I, I hope complemented uh, each other. So Tara, I want to back up even a little bit further and, and get into your, your youth and, and your upbringing. Did you have a religious upbringing and did that influence? Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, not, it, Christmas and Easter. Um, I, like like many New Yorkers, grew up in a kind of Jewish-ish, Episcopalian-ish uh, family. We we went to uh, Hanukkah celebrations with cousins, but also went to church on, on Christmas Eve. And But it really wasn't a significant part of my life growing up, but it was something that I was fascinated with uh, the same way, you know, some 10-year-old girls get fascinated uh, with, with horses. Uh, that was me and, you know, saints. But you could have gone into so many different fields. Why theology? And I, I think I recall reading maybe on your website that when you told your mother that you were going to be studying this, she had a, a, a funny reaction, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. Talk about that. Uh, so I, I, with the caveat that I think I've convinced her by now, uh, <laughs> when I first told her I wanted to study theology, she said, but you know, when you meet people and you tell them that, they're going to be so weirded out. <laughs> talk to people at cocktail parties about God, like religion's the one thing you don't talk about. Um, and I've actually found, uh, to my surprise and, and, and sometimes delight, that that's the opposite is true. That when you tell people, um, I'm a theologian, or uh, and I, I'm about to say an ex-theologian, but a priest I met once told me there's no such thing. <laughs> um, that... People, people hear it, and and I'm, they immediately want to talk about 
um, their view on religion, their relationship to the divine or the absence of a divine. Um, I always imagine it must be like if you say you're a doctor and, and people immediately start telling you their medical problems. Um, people, um, everyone I've met, almost, uh, regardless of their uh, religious affiliation or background, um, has has some sense of something they want to say, some hunger they have, some anger they might have about religion. Um, and I think that we often uh, say we live in a secular age now, but at least anecdotally, I didn't. I have not found that to be true. It's it's really central to the human experience, isn't it? It's sort of this, this, these questions about um, what what else? What how did we how did we get here? You know, is there a transcendent uh, uh, being? Are we part of some something bigger? Um, you, you get to those questions in The World Cannot Give. It, I, I found what was so fascinating about this was that you, you, you play these, um, this, this sort of, this, it's, it's set in a private boarding school. Uh, and it sort of, it, it had it sort of, reminded me of, of Hogwarts with Instagram. Right, like there's, there's, there's these, these very modern elements set in this very traditional setting. But these young ladies are drawn to sort of these transcendent questions about belonging, and they do so in a way that's both youthful and uh, and 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 what you would expect of sixteen and seventeen year olds, but profound at the same time. I wonder if you could sort of walk us through a little bit how you came to tell this particular story. Um, I really wanted to capture something particular about my own experience at a New England boarding school, uh, albeit not one with a lovely view of, uh, of the coastline. Um, and it was that very academically inclined, uh, book smart teenagers, people who've read too much and thought or think they're thinking too much, but don't have the emotional maturity or the life experience to to back that up or to discern what from all of the books they've read and the philosophers whose arguments have heard uh, should be uh, taken seriously, taken with a grain of salt. And um, I think that what I wanted to capture in this book is um, what I love most about the campus novel, which is that it's this kind of like, um, black box, as it were, uh, this, this sort of experimental arena where ideas really seem to matter. And for the, the students at St. Dunstan's, in particular, the uh, members of this chapel choir that make up the main choirs, the, excuse me, the main characters of the book, um, I wanted to explore what happens when well-meaning, uh, hungry people, and I think all of the characters, even, even Virginia, are initially well-meaning, uh, what happens when they take ideas too seriously and, and let, it, um, let it affect them and let it corrode them? So I, I probably should have begun the, the, the discussion of the book with this question, but for folks who have not read it yet, what's that 30,000-foot overview without giving too much away? Uh, it's the uh, relationship between uh, two young women, uh, Laura, a newcomer to the school, and uh, Virginia, the fanatically uh, obsessive, kind of intense, slightly terrifying member of the chapel choir of this local boarding school. And uh, Laura falls under the spell, not just of, of music, singing in this somewhat obsolete chapel choir, one of the last of its kind, but the kind of cult that has sprung up around Virginia and the uh, boys of the choir who see themselves as inheritors to this lost tradition, the lost uh, magic of a certain kind of uh, quasi-religious environment, and uh, the legacy of a controversial writer, Sebastian Webster, the school's most famous and infamous alumnus, who died fighting in the Spanish Civil War. So we're not gonna give the ending of the book away, but we can say that the ending is violent. This is not a happy ending to a coming of age story. Why did you decide to go in that direction? Could have gone in the other direction, could have gone, taken a middle ground, but you did not, why? Um, 
I was attracted in writing this particular novel um, to the sort of legacy of a certain kind of um, story. I think originally, although the book did change, I conceived of it as a sort of contemporary Bonnie and Clyde, a contemporary Thelma and Louise. Um, the kind of aesthetic answer to the idea that the world as it is somehow doesn't have enough poetry, some enough excitement, enough um, transcendence to make it worth living in. And so the uh, the very violent decision that some of the characters make towards the end of the book, for me, is the kind of natural conclusion to this philosophy that they've memed themselves into, you could say, that um, this only something that sort of feels awful or feels terrible, or uh, Virginia uses the word hideous, uh, can possibly set them above the sort of mediocrity they see as a, a life without certain kinds of transcendence. So I want to get into the reaction to the book. You, you got a lot of great reviews from very prominent places. I went on Goodreads, and that would have been before the book came out or in the early stages of, of, of publication. And there, there were many complimentary comments there too, but there were some that were not complimentary. Two questions. Can you explain or, or get into that in a little more detail, number one? And number two, when you see or read a negative comment, what is your reaction? And as a writer, I really want to hear this too. Because <laughs> well, I've been in the same- I have looked at same. my Goodreads, so I'm afraid you know more than I know about it. Um, I, I think that um, a fair critique of this book, uh, one that um, I heard from my first novel, Social Creature, as well, is that these characters are unlikable. Um, I, I have my reservations about thinking about characters that way, but I think, yeah, it's true. It's a, it's very difficult to like anyone in this book, um, everyone, and not just the people responsible for the uh, worst violence in the book. Nobody is really likable. Everyone is deeply, deeply compromised. Uh, but for me, a question that always haunts me as a writer is how do you love the unlikable? How do you love characters that you don't like? And that's the lesson that I, Laura, at the end of the book, as she's grappling with how profoundly compromised everyone she has known has become, how um, perhaps wicked they have become. She still has to ask herself, you know, what were we looking for? Was there any good in what we were trying to find? Was there something real in what we had, even as it got destroyed in such an intense way? And for me, a commitment I have in all of my work is to say, no, people are often unlikable, especially when they're looking for something good or looking for something real. It's precisely that pursuit of the things that are so important that somehow can leave us so firmly off the path. So if people tell me, I hated your book because everyone was unlikable, I think, all right, fair. You know, we agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are creating an unlikable character, and, and this, is a, this is a dilemma or an issue that that many authors have, I, I would cite Stephen King as certainly as a great example. When you are creating them, is there any part of you, and I'm talking you the person, not even necessarily you the writer, is there any part of you that says, I really ought to cut this person a little more slack? And that really is a long way of saying how closely can you identify with characters, fictional characters you create? I think I, I probably identify with, with everybody a little bit. I, I joke that all my characters are self-portraits in one way or the other. Um, if, I, if I hadn't um, gone into writing or academia, I would have gone into theater. Um, that at the time, there, there, was, there was a time when that was something I was strongly considering. And I think that process that actors often do of trying to figure out you know, them in a character has, is a process I still use where um, I think the questions of what does this person want and how can I understand what they want? Um, how can I see the the what is good and real in the desires that motivate them helps me um, it help it helps me see the humanity in them, even as I think that that perhaps more more gracious approach frees me up to be a little harsher when it comes to certain details, the little the little ways that people, um, lie or delude themselves or kind of try to convince others of the person they want to be. And and for me, the the kind of trying to see the best of them or, or relate even emotionally to the best of them um, kind of frees me up, I hope, to be uh, sharper without being cruel. You know, I, 
So I I understand what you're saying about the characters not being likable, but there is a difference in my mind between being likable and being attractive. And so let's talk about Virginia. Uh, you describe her as beautiful, headstrong, uh, 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 maybe a little domineering, but also I thought fragile and uncertain. And I, after I finished the book, I found myself thinking about Virginia, and I get to ask the author, the creator, <laughs> is that exactly what Virginia would have wanted? That after she had left, I was still thinking about her. Absolutely. I think she wants power, but a very particular kind of power, which is, I always see Virginia as someone who is so desperately afraid to be human, to uh, desperately afraid to be ordinary. Um, everything about the way that she con constructs her identity from the fact that when she decides she's going to convert to Christianity, she she won't just, you know, talk to the local school chaplain and do it in this normal way. She, she go is drawn to Catholicism because she thinks it's the most hardcore version of what she wants. Uh, she has a, a very fraught relationship uh, with sex and sexuality that seems uh, deeply tied up with the idea that she doesn't want to be, you know, just another teenager having sex. She wants to be this kind of virgin goddess above it all. And I think that the, all of the decisions that she makes, uh, horrific though they are, come from this absolute terror of what if I'm just a human being? What if I'm just as uncertain, as confused, as scared, as potentially annoying as any other student in the school? And that she is so unable to contend with herself as a flawed human being that she makes herself into this myth and makes decisions knowing that they will transform her almost into a, a work of art rather than a person. Yeah, I, I found myself too thinking about her in the context in, in comparison with sort of the anti-Virginia, in my reading anyways, which was Bonnie, uh, which is Laura's first roommate. Um, and, but they're both very specifically and very particularly constructing an identity for themselves. Um, they couldn't be any more different in any other sense, but it all comes back, I thought, to this the sense of uh, not just the search for uh, a higher meaning, but for an understanding of who they are and who they present to the world. Am I over-interpreting that? Oh, that's absolutely right. Uh, Bonnie is my favorite character in the book, uh, so I'm glad we get to talk about her. <laughs> so, so Bonnie is extremely annoying. She is a would-be Instagram influencer, uh, perhaps in the Caroline Kellaway mold, one might say. Uh, she is uh, extremely cringe, as uh, the kids say, yeah. uh, constantly trying to record these uh, these chapel choir, these even songs. Uh, her love of the music seems to be merely aesthetic rather than elevated in a certain way that the chapel choir understands themselves to be, that Virginia understands herself to be. Uh, but she's also, she's kind. She's well-meaning. She's a decent person and a good friend and she's easy to be these with qualities don't come come through because people think she's irritating yeah so but it, she is the uh, just the the mirror of virginia in many ways and i very much intended them to be you are also a distinguished writer of nonfiction, including uh, many essays that have been published in the wall street journal and the washington post and the new york times and and there's a long list of them i wanted to get into a couple of them uh, this one really caught my eye. It was published in the New York Times on May 8th of 2020, which is the beginning of COVID, or the worst part of COVID. And that was titled, Christianity Gets Weird. Modern life is ugly, brutal, and barren. Maybe you should try a Latin mass. Great headline. Tell us about that essay, what you were saying in that essay. Sure. Uh, so it was part of a wider work that I'm doing now um, about the sort of contemporary spiritual landscape in America among young people. And in that article, I was interested in, in the revival uh, of certain kinds of uh, traditional Christianity as a, a source of meaning, but also a source for a certain kind of aesthetic identity. Um, I think the uh, New York Times picked a, a headline for another version of the piece that said, the future of Christianity is punk. Um, <laughs> and my particular interest in that piece and more broadly is how we uh, simultaneously search for transcendence and, as you say, construct our own identities, our own uh, personal brands, if we want to get to Twitter about it, and how these, these impulses intersect and how for uh, this group of young people, 
a certain kind of, whether it's a traditionalist Catholicism or the uh, Anglo-Catholic wing of the Episcopal Church, uh, whether sort of smells and bells and incense did something uh, for people for whom certain kinds of, uh, let's say, Christmas and Easter Christianity or uh, other forms of uh, generic spirituality seemed uh, insufficient or insufficiently challenging or insufficiently intense. So another essay it was published in the American Interest was titled What the Culture War is Really About. And, and you contend there that it's not race, gender, or free speech, but a debate about human nature. Can you expound on that and what was in that sure. essay? Uh, so I think that I, I always try to stay out of culture war debates, but something that I do think is really interesting is that uh, when we talk about um, gender, for example, um, what, what often kind of comes to play is this, this question of, which I think is implicit, it's often not rendered explicit, but there's something very complicated and weird about human beings. Um, we have a lot of freedom, creative freedom, imagination, uh, the ways in which we tell stories about ourselves, the ways in which we shape our destiny, um, seem like they're at least in part up to us. We're also members of, of communities, uh, communities that give us language, that give us stories, that were shaped by those in a particular ways. And we're also uh, animals that are wedded to uh, particular physical states, to, to our own bodies. There are ways in which we're not free. And I think these three, these three elements, um, you know, it's, I mean, what, what is it but the human condition to work out what, what do we choose what is what is sort of thrust upon us by a, by an animal state? What is thrust upon us by a social state? How do we in turn affect that social state? Uh, these are questions that I think we've always been uh, working out. We've always been trying in, in various ways to to get a handle on. And I think that uh, without being too reductionist about it, a lot of our contemporary debates do uh, touch on the fact that this is still an unsettled question. Um, I'm actually working on uh, my next book, which is a, an intellectual history of self-making. Uh, it deals more directly uh, with these very same issues. You know, uh, Tara, I'm, I'm curious, that, you know, you're, you're, you're such an accomplished writer in, in, in so many different formats. Um, is there one that just feels like home? I'm a novelist at heart. Um, I, I love it, but I also uh, really, really hate it. Uh, it, it is a deeply, deeply emotional process uh, in a way that uh, nonfiction isn't. Um, that said, I think that my, my nonfiction and my novels uh, support each other. Sometimes I'll, you know, write a whole novel and then realize, oh, you know, as, as just as we're talking now, I, I realize how much of self-made came out of writing Virginia in uh, The World Cannot Give. And sometimes writing a, a book of nonfiction will get me interested in, in questions that then get explored in a novel. So while I do uh, have have both a greater love and let's say a greater hate for the novel writing process, um, I really do see the two as reinforcing one another. So you said you're a novelist at heart and um, at, the, at the risk of a bad pun, God bless you, I, I can totally relate to that. You mentioned your next book and I just want to give the title of it, and it's coming out, I guess, in June from Public Affairs, Self-Made, Curating Our Image from Da Vinci to the Kardashians. Again, a great title. Give us a little preview. Well, thanks, I'm very, I'm very excited about it. Uh, that's now, uh, hopefully, I'll be seeing uh, galleys very soon. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's in it, or? No. Sure, yes. Oh, um, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so it, is, it is an intellectual history of the idea of self-creation looking at the uh, the self-made man, uh, the kind of entrepreneur, and the dandy, the uh, person who creates himself or herself as a work of art, as two sides of the same coin. Uh, it tells the story uh, from the Renaissance all the way into the present day and the land of Instagram about this idea that uh, what it means to be a human being is to make yourself to look inwards and let your uh, your desires become a source of um, your reality. You might say you are who you want to be. And uh, we look at Bo Brummel and Oscar Wilde. We look at uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio and Mussolini. We look at Andrew Carnegie and P.T. Barnum. Oh, wow. And we look at Kim Kardashian and Caroline Calloway. 
I so can't, it's, I can't uh, wait. I a bit of a wait. tour through some of uh, the uh, most notorious and uh, exciting self-creators in, let's say, uh, modern European and American history. That's phenomenal. Um, you know, I, when when you uh, think about the, the the trajectory of your both your academic development, but also your development as a writer, does that theology, that grounding in theology, come back into all of your work? Absolutely. Uh, as that priest said, there's no th such thing as an ex theologian, and I think uh, <laughs> even as as a novelist, uh, certainly as a as a writer of nonfiction, um, those questions of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to have a relationship with um, an idea, an understanding, a question about where the world can, come, comes from? Uh, I think those questions are essential to kind of who we are as people as they are to understanding the world around us. And uh, I've been lucky that the fiction and the nonfiction afford me two, uh, two avenues to exploring that. So we're almost out of time, but maybe in about 30 seconds and we could do a whole show on this. Talk a little bit, a little bit about craft. When you write, do you, do you outline first? Just a 15, 20 second overview of your craft, how you do it. Uh, I do something that makes me insane, which is I rewrite the book from scratch every draft until I don't hate it. Uh, and at a certain point, <laughs> I know it's getting better when I'm retyping it from a PDF and not, and, and not just rewriting it. Uh, but that is that is how I work, and it is uh, makes me miserable, but it also makes better books um, because I, I change so much each time. Well, Tara, it's uh, you're a great writer, and we enjoyed having you on the show today. She's Tara Isabel Burton, and the book is The World Cannot Give. And that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on social media or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>